Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never practice nunchucks in a crowded room. Never eat chole before a road trip. Always take your shirt off before you iron it. Don't take a call near a swimming pool. And don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. Assume you're in love with somebody and the two of you don't want to get married but want to live together. Should you do it? Well, frankly, it's none of my business, but I don't see any impediment to your doing it. It's not against the laws. And if you're adults and you want to do it, well, by all means, go ahead. Just don't do it in Uttarakhand. Let me explain. You can do it in any city of India, any village maybe, and you would not be breaking the law. You can do it maybe in Lucknow, which used, which is the state bordering Uttarakhand. And Uttarakhand, in fact, was part of UP in the old days, and there's no problem. But drive out, get to Uttarakhand, maybe set up a nice home in the hills, live together. And if you're not married, you'll end up in handcuffs and in separate cells because that's now the law in Uttarakhand. The Uttarakhand Assembly has just passed a new uniform civil code which makes many provisions, but one of them is that people living together are in violation of the law and can end up in jail for three months, six months, something like that. How can you avoid this fate? How can you love each other, live together and not end up in jail? Well, you have to go and register your relationship with the registrar. Various other things follow. They may then inform the parents, the two of you are living together. They may inform the police station. If you then, after having lived together, realize the two of you don't want to go ahead with it and you want to break up, you can't just break up. You've got to go back to the authorities. You've got to tell them, hey guys, it's not work, we're breaking out. And some babu will give you the permission to do that. It's even worse. Assume you're from Uttarakhand and you live in Chennai. Then you can live with somebody, right? Ah, uh, no. Because you're originally from Uttarakhand, the law requires you to go to Uttarakhand, find a registrar and register your live-in relationship, even if you're saying Chennai, Trivandrum, anywhere else. Is it a bizarre law? Well, of course it's a bizarre law. It's an idiotic law. How do these laws get onto the statute books? Well, let me explain. When we talk about a uniform civil code in India, usually we're talking about only one thing. We're talking about the need to get rid of Muslim personal law. The whole business of a uniform civil code has actually become a code, a code phrase for taking away Muslim personal law. Now, there are many complex issues here. My view has always been for as long as I can remember that communities should not have personal laws, that we should have a common civil code. It should be one India and one law. Now, it's difficult sometimes to explain this to Muslims who believe that their rights are under attack. And it's become even more difficult now because the issue has become a measure and a mark of Hindu triumphalism with the BJP. First of all, usually when you talk about uniform civil codes, you're talking about something at a national level. But now BJP states want to include their own civil codes. And for instance, when the Uttarakhand civil code was introduced in the assembly, when the bill was introduced, it was greeted with chants of Jai Shri Ram. So, so much for secularism, so much for one law, one country. It was very clear what the agenda was. Now, because the Uttarakhand government concentrated on this, so did most people who were watching what was happening. And while they were going on about the Hindu-Muslim aspect, they smuggled this clause in. This clause affects Hindus, it affects probably homosexuals as well as heterosexuals. It affects nearly everybody. Why did they do it? Well, two explanations. One is that it protects the right of women. How does it protect the right of women? I have no idea. Go and ask the Uttarakhand chief minister. The other is that live-in relationships are contrary to our culture and that therefore they need some regulation. Now, this is a particularly idiotic argument and I'll explain to you why it is so foolish and so silly. But there is a line, I think, that we've now crossed. Generally, in a liberal society, the law stops at your door. What you do in your private life, 
What you do in your bedroom is your business. It's really not the government's business at all. That's why you live in a liberal democracy. This causes problems. There are countries where the laws were written centuries ago and the laws are not particularly liberal. Let's take Britain for an example. British laws date back to the 1800s, the 1700s, and often they're in direct violation of each other's principles. For instance, you've heard the saying, an Englishman's home is his castle. At the same time the Brits were saying this, they were also passing laws and keeping on the statute books, laws that made all kinds of private behavior illegal. For instance, until the 1960s, homosexual acts between consulting adults were illegal. But there was the publication of the Wolfen Report, there was a national debate, and they abandoned that law. So all over the world, when they find that there are illiberal laws in the books, there is a debate and some attempt to rationalize. Not in India. In India, we have gone in the opposite direction. Let's take the homosexuality law and many other laws that we inherited from the British, but have not had the sense, like the British, to try and rethink them. In India, at Delhi, the Delhi High Court decided that to criminalize homosexual acts between consenting adults was wrong and decriminalized them. The Supreme Court turned this around and said, no, people who engage in such acts are criminals. You know, essentially saying that all gay people in India were indulging in criminal activity. This was done by senior judges and apparently one judge said in open court, this is not such a big issue. I don't see why it's a big issue. I personally have never met a homosexual in my life. Well, as one other judge said to me, obviously the man had never been to boarding school, but it tells you something about the ivory tower in which justice, from which justice is prescribed in India. People don't realize what's happening and regard it within their rights to interfere with your rights and my rights. It's a thing, it's a principle that worries me because we really don't accept the right to privacy. We give the government the rights to come in and tell us all kinds of things about our private lives that are really not the concern of any government. Homosexuality is one example. I can't think of any Western democracy where there's been any question of treating homosexuality as an illegal act in the 60s or the 70s. There are a few laws in the statute books in American states that are never implemented, in some Southern American states, but otherwise, no. Of course, homosexuality being legal or illegal is a non-issue. Only in India up to recently were we even debating issues like this. Why is it wrong? Well, it's wrong because there's a conception of rights. There's a conception that anybody who's a citizen of India and of any democracy has the right to live with dignity and has the right to live his or her life the way he wants to. The government does law. It doesn't do anything else. The government does governance. It doesn't come and tell us how to live our lives. But no, that's a principle we've just lost sight of in India and that worries me. There are other aspects that worry me also. Not all judges see that privacy and individual rights are worthless. There's a case from the Delhi High Court about 15 years ago. It indicates how the laws in the police force in India work. A young couple got married. They had a religious wedding. They went, wanted to register their wedding. They went to the courthouse to get some papers to register their weddings. While they were waiting for the paperwork, they apparently kissed. Two constables saw them kissing and promptly charged them with obscenity and behavior punishable with months in jail. They challenged this, of course. It went to the Delhi High Court and Justice Murlidhar said this was absurd, upbraided the police and threw the case out. But that's rare and it's an indication of how the police in India already without the encouragement of the Uttarakhand go government or anyone behave. They do what they want. They bully people and they use these laws, laws that control our private lives, to extort money, to get themselves rich. What the Uttarakhand code will do is make many officials and many policemen very rich, but it will make ordinary citizens very unhappy. There's one other thing. I think it's clear by now, as much as we may pretend otherwise, that many members of the Indian middle class don't really care about freedoms. They don't care about freedom of speech. They don't care about a free press. They don't really care about the opposition. 
This is not a new phenomenon. We rewrite history, but the truth is that in 75 and 76, during Indira Gandhi's emergency, when the opposition was locked up, the press was censored, civil liberties were suspended, the middle class was very happy. They didn't really mind. They wanted prices to come down. They wanted the trains to run on time. And that attitude, I think, has extended to the present day. The attitude is, as long as I go on with my life, what do I care about the opposition? What do I care about some journalists rotting in a jail cell? I don't really care. I want progress. I want infrastructure. Okay, fine, fair enough. I don't agree with that, but I can understand that. But do many members of the middle class understand the difference between authoritarianism and totalitarianism? An authoritarian state is one where dissent is not tolerated, where the opposition is persecuted. It's governmental action really on media and on other politicians. An authoritarian state seeks to curtail dissent. A totalitarian state seeks to control the way we live, the way we eat, the way we love, the way we go about our lives. I'll give you some examples. Mao Zedong's China was a totalitarian state. The Communist Party decided what you would wear. It decided where you would live. It decided what profession you would take. It decided how many children you would have. A more recent example, the Taliban in Afghanistan. No Afghan can live his or her life the way they would want to. They have to live it according to the Taliban. They can't put on music in their homes. They can only eat certain things. They can only do certain things. That's a totalitarian state. Now, I always say to people in the middle class who give me this authoritarian stuff, what does it matter to me? Do you realize that each time the government crosses a line, each time it passes legislation affecting our private lives, you are becoming closer and closer to a mirror image of Afghanistan and the Taliban? Do you really want India to be Talibanized? Do you not see that what may, according to you, not affect you because you're not going to live with anyone? will one day affect you because the more the state interferes with our private lives, the more these boundaries are pushed, the more you and I are going to suffer. So it's time to think. By itself, the Uttarakhand Civil Code is not particularly significant, the agenda with Hindu Muslim anyway. But the fact that they could smuggle this kind of clause in, the fact that it's passed, it passed the assembly without any kind of debate, tells you the direction in which our politicians are heading. And it's not good news. Thank you.